So for number six, maybe the simplest possible example is the one with a discontinuity like this, where it's one at zero and it's zero elsewhere. Uh, many uh, of you try to make it work with a continuous function, but as application one shows, application functions do not work. I mean, you need a discontinuity, otherwise it's not a true statement. So. Um, well, what you, you really, uh, in a case like that, first thing, so f of 0 is 1, and f of x is 0 for x between 0 and 1. So you define your function like that, and uh, you can show, using the boost sums, that this is integrable. Uh, it's easy, so what we do is we take p, uh, regular partition, which means that p is uh, x0, x1, xn, and for xk we take k over n. Okay, so our first point is 0, second point is going to be 1 over n, all the way up to n over n, which is 1, so that's what we want. Uh, now, the lower The lower, uh, the lower bounds are all zero, of course, because you divide your interval in equal pieces here, and there is at least one point in, which in every interval which is zero, and you cannot go below zero. So your minimum is really zero. The maximum is also zero, so this is for all i between 1 and n. The maximum is also 0, except for the first interval. You see that at the first interval, this very first interval here, has a point with a jump. So the maximum is 1. But elsewhere, there are no jumps. I mean, it's just the zero function, and it's going to be zero. So we're going to say that it's a zero for i between 2, the two, 2 and n, and uh, that m, capital M of f, x0, x1, which is the interval of 0, 1 over n, is uh, 1. So, when we do the lower double sum, we find zero. We have only zero terms, there is nothing else. And the upper double sum is all zeros except for the first time, the first rectangle. Okay? My first rectangle is here. And the other are, are not rectangles, they are flattened rectangles, they, all, they are all equal to zero. This one is 1 times 1 over n. So that's 1 over n. So now we say, well, for every epsilon, there exists an n. such that if n is bigger than capital N, then 1 over n is less than epsilon. Of course, 1 over n goes to 0, or the Archimedean property. I can always find a natural n which is bigger than 1 over epsilon. So, whatever reason, uh, uh, this works. And now, what we say, therefore, uh, for every epsilon, there exists a partition, and the partition is going to depend on n. The n. We are going to take for a partition the n we just picked, uh, such that you, the upper double sum minus the lower double sum is less than epsilon. So this proves that f is integral. OK? 
so we have that that is integrable, uh, which implies that uh, the lower Darboux sum is less than the interval, which is less than the upper Darboux sum. But this is true for every part of uh, Darboux sum. So let's let's pick our favorite uh, Darboux, uh, our favorite partition, and this is zero, and this is one red. guess as we have just computed. Therefore, we can use the squeezing theorem because here we have a sequence that goes to zero, this goes to zero, so our integral is zero. But our function is not identically zero. Okay, our function is positive or zero, is not identically zero, but its integral is still zero. So how much more general could I be? I mean, what, what could be a more general function for which this example would work? I mean, for which basically the same argument would work? Well, if you are zero and you take finitely many jumps, positive jumps, you are going to get the same result. Okay? And uh, it's more work because then you, you need to be careful about uh, how the partition works and so on. But it's uh, essentially the same argument. So this does not contradict application one because this is not a continuous function. That's why. Okay? When you have a continuous function, which is non zero, which is uh, positive or zero, and which is strictly positive somewhere, what application one did was say, well, around my point, it has to be strictly positive because it's a continuous function, so it doesn't drop too fast. I mean, it can drop as fast as you want, but it's not a jump. This is the point. If it's not a jump, there is an interval around which my function is strictly positive. Therefore, I can find a rectangle where I'll have a strictly positive integral, and the rest I can throw away, I know it's positive anyway, or zero. So I'm at least as big as this thing, therefore it's strictly positive. But that argument fall, breaks down here because it's a jump. So I cannot say that, I cannot say that around this point I ha I'll have my function positive. That's not true. Immediately after the, the jump, it's a zero. Okay, number eight. Well, by definition of um, and time we have is double inequality for every x. And because this is an integrable function, we can integrate across. This is just a constant. This is therefore it's integrable. Not only it's integrable, but this is equal to b minus a times m of f a b. And this is capital M f a b b minus a. OK? So we get our double inequality.
9 give an example of function for which uh, we have a strict inequality. So then again, I saw many people uh, trying to prove inequality for functions who had a constant sign. That's not going to work, okay? If your sign is constant, your absolute value is going to be equal, well, if your function is positive, the absolute value of f is f. So you're not going to have a strict inequality, it's going to be equal. Okay, so you need something that changes its sign, basically, which, uh, you know, many, many different possibilities. For instance, we could take uh, f of x equal x on minus 1, 1. And of course, these two areas are the same. Therefore, the integral of f is going to be 0. And you can check by the fundamental theorem of calculus that this is indeed 0. But if you do minus 1, 1 of absolute value of f, you must split it in two pieces, minus 1 to 0, minus x, plus 0 to 1, x. Okay, you're taking the absolute value of this. So you get minus half of x squared between minus 1 and 0 equal to half. And then uh, the other piece is half of x squared between 0 and, and 1. And you get half again. So this is 1 and this is 0. So absolute value of f is strictly less than the integral of the absolute value because this one is 0 and this one is 1. Okay, there are of course many other choices that will be there. So 10 uh, A we just compute this and we end up with 4FG Now, we use that to show that fg is integrable. Well, what we're going to say is that, so define s of x as being x squared, and note that f plus g squared is the composition of s and f plus g. Now, this is continuous, uh, I'm sorry, this is integrable, and this is continuous. This is integrable because I'm summing two integrable functions, and we know it's integrable. Now, when I compose from the outside with a continuous function, I get something which is integrable. Okay? So, that proves that we get that f plus g squared is integrable. Of course, we do exactly the same thing for f minus g. is also integral, same argument, and therefore for, well, fg is one-fourth of f plus g squared minus f minus g squared. So this is integral, and this is integral. And when you do a difference of two integrable functions, you get an integrable function. So, fg is integral as well.
13 The easiest way is to define the function uh, f like this, capital F like this, and that's uh, an uh, uh, differentiable function as uh, proved in application 2, was it? Yeah, that's application 2, page 2 to 1. We know that f is differentiable since f is continuous capital F is differentiable on AB. Uh, it's important here to note that so F is continuous on the AB closed. And, but differentiability is al always for us on open intervals. So we get that capital F is differentiable on AB open. Okay? And uh, then and F prime is equal to F on AB open again. So F uh, is, well, our hypothesis is that capital F is zero. That's what we're assuming, right? Yeah, we're assuming that capital F is always zero. Uh, so F is also always zero because it's the derivative. <laughs> is a prime, so that's the derivative of the zero function, which is zero, of course. So we end up with f is zero on a, b open. Now the, the question was, show that f is zero on a, b closed. So you still need to do some work. You need to show that f of a is zero and f of b is zero, okay? Uh, but now you use continuity. And you can, for instance, say, well, a plus 1 over n belongs to ab, of course, and well, at least if n is big enough. Uh, and a plus 1 over n tends to a. Okay, so I take the sequence a plus 1 over n just to be concrete. I could take any sequence a n in ab converging to a. Maybe I should do that. Anyway, it's the same. So, what is f of a plus 1 over n? Zero. It's zero. It's zero because we know already that if you are strictly bigger than a, the function is zero. And to where does f of a plus 1 over n converge? f of a, because f is continuous at a. So f of a must be zero. And you do the same thing for b. You'll do b minus 1 over n goes to b. f of b minus 1 over n is zero. So f of b is zero. Okay, and you, you get like this your two endpoints. A is simply the extreme value theorem. There exists X not and X one in A B. such that f of x is between f of x naught and f of x1. And, of course, first check the hypothesis. f is continuous. a, b is closed and bounded. OK? 
Okay, these are the two ingredients that we need to apply the extreme value term. Now, uh, we are assuming that g is a positive function or zero. So when we multiply across by g of x, this is what we get. So f of x naught is a constant, therefore we can pull it out. And the reason we can integrate is that we have this is a continuous function, g is continuous, this is continuous as product of uh, two continuous functions, and this is continuous as well. So that's why these functions are all integrable, and we can integrate across the inequalities. Now we get this. Now there are two possibilities. Either the integral of g is zero or it's strictly positive. It cannot be negative because it's a positive function. So uh, the first case in this uh, question is to assume that the integral of g is strictly positive. So we can divide across by the integral of g. Let's call this guy d. This is a number, right? It's the ratio of two integrals. And let's uh, and so we what we see is that uh, d is between f of x naught and f of x one. F is continuous on x naught x1. Well, actually, I don't know which one is smaller, whether it's x naught x1 or x1 x naught, but it doesn't really matter. So the intermediate value theorem applies. There exists a C in x naught x1 or in x1 x naught such that f of x, f of C is D. Okay, that's what the intermediate value term says. So we get f of c equal to uh, what d is, which is the ratio there. And we get our formula. Which is really a generalization of the integral mean value theorem. Because if you let g equal 1 in this formula, what happens is that you have f here, f of c, and then you get b minus a, which is exactly the, the int integral mean value term. Yeah. Uh, could you also do it like this and say, we know that since G is integral on AB, it's continuous on AB. Therefore, couldn't you rewrite it saying that um, the integral of AB of FG is equal to F of C times G of C times B minus A over G of C minus times B minus A and everything cancels out? Maybe you I don't think this works because you could use the integrate mean value term. 
and say that the integral from a to b of f g is f of c times g of c times b minus a. Right. You could do that, yes. But then I don't see how you are going to get to well, the set of formula. Then if you leave the f of c alone, you could say the integral of a to b of g is this integral of g of g so do you agree with this claim? Why not? It's not the same C. You have a C that depends on G. That's one C. Then you have a C which depends on FG, which is another C a priori. So you cannot, you cannot use the same C for both. But that's a good remark. I mean, if you could, then yes, it would be much simpler to do it this way. Why could you use the same C? That's the wrong way to see things. Why can you? That's what you should ask yourself. Because you are, the theorem tells there is a C somewhere. So that's it. I mean, that's, it's a number. That's all you know. Now, the fact that we always call it C doesn't mean that it's always the same number. It's going to depend on your function. So we get the formula in the case where the integral is not zero. And uh, we still want to show that this is a true statement when the integral is zero. But that becomes a triviality because if this is zero, then by application one, G is zero, okay? Because I have a continuous non-negative function whose integral is zero. The only way this can happen is if I'm integrating zero, okay? So G is zero on A B, and therefore uh, everything works here, right? I mean, uh, the integral from A f g is the integral from a to b of f times zero, and that's zero. And then f of c times the integral of b of zero is also zero. So you find that this is zero and this is zero, therefore they're equal. Okay, so in this, in this case too, you can say, well, then this is this. Questions? Okay. Okay. So let's go on with applications of integration uh, in Chapter Four. Let's talk a little bit about Wallis integrals, which is uh, 'on of uh, what is integral is uh, simply i n equal to the integral from zero to pi over two of sines to a power n of x dx this is a well defined integral because sinus is a continuous function and sinus to the n is also continuous therefore I can take the integral so our first task here is to compute a few of these things. So I0 is 1, uh, sine is pi over 2. And then if we do I1 the antiderivative for uh, sinus is minus cosinus. 
and again we can do that because we have a function here which is differentiable and whose derivative is sine sex and this is cos cosine square over 2 is 0 and therefore we find 1 for i1 then uh, we want a recursion formula for general n and we, what we do is we say well so take now n bigger than 2 and let's uh, rewrite this as being sine square sinus n minus 2 is dx this is 1 minus cosine square times sinus x to the n minus 2 Just by doing a substitution sine square equal to 1 minus sine square, we get here i n minus 2. So i n is i n, I n minus 2 minus this thing here. Okay? So can we compute this thing? Well, it turns out that we can by doing. Uh, an integration by parts <coughs> so what we do is Okay, so uh, we, we have two functions here really. This is the same as sinus n minus 2x cosinus x times cosinus x. Okay, we write this product as being this term times cosinus x times cosinus x. The reason we do that is because the derivative of sinus is cosinus. So an antiderivative for this guy is, and maybe I should use the notation, so uh, let's say that this is f of x and this is g of x. So an antiderivative, or I should use capital G here, uh, an antiderivative for f is capital F and uh, that's 1 over n minus 1 sinus to the power n minus 1 x okay just use the chain rule you take the derivative of sinus x to the n minus 1 that's n minus 1 sinus x to the n minus 2 times derivative of sinus x which is cosinus x so we get exactly this guy now g prime of uh, g of x is the derivative of this guy which is minus sinus x Okay, so by integration by parts, we are going to get 1 over n minus 1 sinus x to the n minus 1 times cosinus x between 0 and pi over 2 minus, we copy again the antiderivative, which is this guy here. And we need now the derivative of uh, the other function, so it's minus sinus x. Now, what happens when I plug pi over 2 is that I get to 0. And when I, get, when I plug 0, I get to 0 because of this guy. So this whole thing here is 0. And we find uh, a minus there with here, which is 
uh, 1 over n minus 1, so it's a plus now, and then uh, sinus x to the power n. So we are quite happy because we started with i n and we finished with i n, which is usually not a good sign, but in this case it's fine. Okay, so we do our integration by parts, and this piece is 1 over n minus 1 i n. I hope. Okay, so uh, what do we have here? I0 is okay. So I n is I n minus 2 minus 1 over n minus 1 I n. So this is I n times 1 plus 1 over n minus 1 equal to I n minus 2. And therefore I n is n minus 1 plus 1, which is n over n minus 1 times I n minus 2. I n is therefore n minus 1 over n I n minus 2. For n larger than 2. But remember that I 0 is 1 and I 1 is pi over 2. So we can con go on like this, do I 3 for instance. I 3 is going to be 2 over 3 I 1, which is pi over 2, so 2 thirds of pi over 2. Then I 4 would be, uh, why did I D, or how did I do that? Uh, okay, that's fine, it's, it's an original way to count, but uh, we'll get there. So, I 3 is this thing, I 2 is uh, 2 minus 1 over 2 times i0, which uh, is 1, so we get half. And then, so you see what's going to happen? When I do i4, I'll do f uh, 3 fourth i2 times 3 fourths, so i2 is this thing, times 1 half. So all the even are related and all the odd are related. And you keep multiplying and uh, it's a real pleasure compared to having to actually compute sinus x to the n and, and do the antiderivative. Okay, we have a very nice formula that allows us to do this. Okay. to get to pi. Uh, the thing is that uh, uh, as you see i1 is pi over 2 and what we're going to show is actually uh, the what is integrals are easy to compute and they give us an estimate for pi. Uh, in order to do that we need uh, to show some convergence properties which uh, we're going to start by saying the following. So uh, the only thing we need is uh, this. So up to now, this is the thing. Uh, no. Okay. So this is the thing we really need. We have a recursion that allows us to compute things. So first step, 
sinus n to the x is less than sinus x to the n minus 1 for x in 0 power 2. Why is this a true statement? Why is this true? When I raise sinus x to the power n, I get a smaller number than when I raise it to the power n minus 1. Sin x one. Yes. Okay. That's because sin x is less than 1. In, in this interval here, it's between 0 and 1. So we take integrals on both sides and we get i n less than i n minus 1. So the sequence i n is a decreasing sequence. Okay. Now uh, we use the formula that we proved there that uh, i n is so We use the fact that i n is n minus 1 over n times i n minus 2 and say that this is bigger than I n minus 1 over n i n minus 1. Why is this a true inequality that uh, n minus 1 over n i n minus 2 is bigger than n minus 1 over n i n minus 1? because it's decreasing. Yeah, that's what we just uh, did here. So we say that i n minus 2 is bigger than i n minus 1. Okay, so we get uh, that i n over i n minus 1, all these numbers are positive numbers because the integral, it's the integral of a positive function. Okay, so we know it's a strictly positive, they are all strictly positive. So this is bigger than n minus 1 over n. Okay, that's... And uh, from here, we also know that i n over i n minus 1 is less than 1. So we get the double inequality that i n over i n minus 1 is squeezed between 1 and n minus 1 over n. So what can I say about i n over i n minus 1? It, uh, it must converge to 1 because this guy converges to 1 and this one is just 1 minus 1 over n it converges to 1 as well so i n over i n minus 1 converges to 1. Okay? So the ratio of m converges to 1. Now, I claim that this implies that i 2n plus 1 over i 2n converges to 1. How can I say that? How can I justify that? <coughs> that the line above implies the line below. Without reading. Anyway, I think it's just a Y. Okay. So, I to N, does, does this make you think of something? Subsequence? Right? Okay, you are doing a subsequence. So, we are doing a subsequence where well, maybe we should give a name to this thing. Let a n be i n over i n minus one, and let's say uh, so. And let's compute a to n plus one. Okay, define a n to be this ratio. Then a to n plus one is i to n plus one over i to n. 
right? And this must converge to 1 because the sequence converges to 1. Okay, that's a good review for your final. Okay, if I have a sequence that converges to 1, then my subsequence converges to the same unit. Okay, so. Now, why is this exciting? Well, the reason is, so what is this? Yeah, the reason is that you can do, so we started computing I0, I1, I2, I3, and so on, but then you can do an induction and get a nice formula for uh, the even ones and the odd ones. I'm not going to torture you with that. You can have a look at, at that, but it turns out that I2n, is actually uh, all the odd numbers, 1, 3, and so on, all the way to 2n minus 1, over all the even, 2, 4, 6, all the way to 2n, times pi over 2. Okay, you prove that by induction, it's quite easy, once you know what the formula is, of course. But, uh, so you can check that at least. Then I2n, plus 1 is something similar. So this time you get all the even numbers over uh, all the odd, except that you stop at 2n plus 1. Right. Okay, so these are formulas that you can prove by induction based on the recursion formula that we, we have just proved. Okay, so when we do our when we do our ratio, which is I to N plus one over well maybe I should do it here. So when we do i to n plus 1 over i to n, well, we get all the even numbers over these odd numbers, because that's i to n plus 1. And then we get i to n over i to n, so we take the inverse, 2n, over 1, 3, over way to 2n. Uh, minus 1 and uh, times 2 over pi. Okay, I'm just doing the ratio of these two things. So, uh, can we arrange this in a little nicer way? Okay, so, huh. so the way to look at this thing is to say, okay, I'm going to take this is 2 over 1 times 2 over 3 times 4 over 3 times 4 over 5. You see what I'm doing? I'm picking one term from here and one term from here. And so you do that. You see what the pattern is? You take your even number. You divide it by the corresponding odd and then the following odd. And you have these numbers appearing twice every time. And so, this should end up with 2n over 2n minus 1 and 2n over 2n plus 1. Times 2 over pi. And this whole thing goes to 1. Okay? So I get a nice form for pi because of that. Okay, since uh, I, so we say that it was I to N plus 1 over I to N goes to 1, we can use that and get uh, uh, the following formula. So, same thing, 2 over 1 times 2 over 3, 4 over 3, 4 over 5, 
so on. So our last one is 2n over 2n minus 1, 2n over 2n plus 1. This whole thing converges to pi over 2. So again, it's uh, an incredible simple formula to get pi over 2. I mean, you are just, you know, multiplying very simple numbers to get a very complicated one as your limit. Okay, so it's a little bit the same pattern than last time when we were uh, finding a power series expansion for arctangent and it gave us uh, a very nice series, I mean, with very simple terms uh, for as a limit for pi. So that, um, then there are uh, other ways to express this product here with factorials. Okay? But somehow I don't think it's very wise for me to do that just before asking for you to rate my FCQs. So <laughs> I'll uh, abstain. <coughs> Any question? Okay. So. Would you be willing to bring the FC quiz back to upstairs? Thank you.